Can you hear that when she says that, when the computer says that? Yeah. Okay, today we're going to talk about um, the mid-1800 Opium Wars, and it's going to relate directly to um, King Leopold's ghost in the sense that Britain was the first, well, after Spain, the second big European power that expanded upon the world scene. And one of the places in which they expanded and earned the most revenue and trade with was into China in the, in the mid-1800s. So since this is world history class, I guess we should talk a little about the world. And this part of the world in which we haven't ventured into yet is um, East Asia. Okay. And here is a map of China, this big, huge, very diverse landmass, right? Most of the large part of the, the biggest population per capita lives within these borders here. Number two is India here. Okay. So we're going to talk briefly about how the backwater, the former backwater area of Western Europe in the 1500s, Europe, Europe was this you know, medieval decentralized poor backwater, how they were able to successfully move into the, one of the biggest markets in the world. And ironically, the United States today is still trying to open up the biggest market in the world, right? Google would love to get in there. And <clears throat> Google and other US companies would, are still trying to fight to get into the Chinese market. But for all kinds of reasons, uh, mostly political, they are not able to. So we're going to talk about this part of China, Southeast I, uh, China. Today, we're going to Hong Kong, right? Even today, Hong, many folks in Hong Kong are trying to fight for their independence or at least a sense of um, local sovereignty against right, China, which controls them. So let me give you a little background about, geez, what's the deal with Hong Kong? Becky, uh, Hannah, have you heard anything about the Hong Kong news, all those protesters trying to separate from China or at least get semblance of independence from China? And you can just thumbs up it if you want. Where's my chat? Here's my chat. You don't watch news. You do it yourself. I don't watch news. Oh uh, well, start what? Start reading the news. Maybe the watching cable. Don't read. Don't watch any of that cable stuff. Read the news. It's better. Okay. So new imperialism in China. Um, this cartoon. I love political cartoons. They capture a lot. Um, this one shows how there's an angry Chinese man, and yes, this is a racist image because look at his like pointed right vampire type fingers are trying to prevent all these other world powers from carving up the chinese cake xin is the word for china in french so here you have queen victoria wanting her piece of the pie wilhelm ii of germany with this funny little prussian hat wanting his piece the nicholas the czar of russia nicholas ii wanting his piece Here's Marianne in France wanting her piece. And here's this Japanese samurai wanting his piece. So in other words, many rising powers in the world wanted a piece of the Chinese market because it was so vast and wealthy. So how did Britain get an access to the Chinese market? Well, in the, 16, in the 1760s, right, us historians never have a simple answer for anything. That's why we're rarely on... Um, the cable news channels. So in the 1760s, the British colonized India and through the use of allies, were able to control large parts of India and export, um, export a lot of products for sale and to enrich the British Empire. So here's a map of British India right here. What was their main export from India? Well, tea and opium. Okay, and what the British East India Company is, uh, one of the biggest global companies in world history, the British East India Company, if you know, um, if you remember anything from your colonial US history, it was the British East India Company who was trying to sell tea to in Boston right before the revolution and the Boston revolutionaries threw the tea in the bay, right, the big 
and that was the Tea Party. So the British, British East India Company in India replaced the best land, right? If you want to have the best land producing agricultural for, agriculture for food to um, feed your population, you're going to be doing okay. But the, what the British East India Company did was take that best agricultural land, right? Maybe like the Sacramento Valley or places that's um, well watered and rich soil. And instead of growing food, they grew tea and opium. Here is an image of a tea plantation, right? And you can, I uploaded the slides to this already if you want to just take your time. So here's some of the best land. So no longer are they growing lentils or garbanzos or food items. They're growing um, tea in this example. What's the result of, what do you think is going to happen, Becky, if I can pick on you, if you shift the major parts of your good land from growing food to growing this product you're going to export abroad? What's going to, what might be one downfall for the local population? What do you think? Yep, exactly. Not enough food for the locals, she said, for those of you watching on TV. One of the biggest famines in world history happened during this time. 10 million died in the eastern, east, yeah, in the eastern part of the British Empire. It was called the Bengal Famine. And it's something embarrassingly, I, I, I'm a long time historian, I did not learn about it until fairly recently. So 10 million people died because of the shift from growing food to growing this product for export, tea. Another thing that was grown for export was opium. And un unfortunately, we know all too well the price opium takes on families and our society and on everything. A very, very highly addicted, dr addictive drug now and then, of course. And the issue that the British Empire has, what are we going to do with all this opium? Where are we going to sell it? We need to open new markets. So let me show you, going back to a map about the international trade during this time. Um, and Hannah, if I can pick on you, I don't know if you can see this map, but what, what is China importing from the rest of the world? In other words, what arrows are going towards China? What arrows are going towards China? Can you see? None, exactly. So China's like, no, we're good. We don't need any of your European manufactured goods. We have our old spices and silk and silver. We are good. So what ended happening <clears throat> was Britain and other European nations were importing so much stuff from China, enriching Chinese merchants and, and others. So Britain was in big time debt to China, a lot like the United States is in big time debt to China now, right? Britain and other Western European countries were basically funneling a lot of the golden, a lot of the gold and silver being brought up and dug up from the Americas, and it ended up, most of it ended up in China during this time. So what can Britain sell to China? Well, they started to try to sell opium to China. And here's a very racist image of this Chinese guy squatting down, and this British man, you see this big bowling ball thing? That is how opium was manufactured and sold. That is pure opium, a big freaking bowling ball of opium. So here is a cartoon depicting a British man trying to sell opium to China. And what do you think China authorities said to the British offer to import opium? I'm going to pick on you again, Hannah. What if you were a Chinese official and you were offered all the opium you could smoke? What would you say? Vice Minister, no, exactly. <clears throat> so Lin Shenshu, just like Nancy Reagan in 1980 said no, um, Lin Shenshu said no, thank you to drugs. This was one of the, this was the head of China at the time.
He said, your British majesty, this is a letter to Queen Victoria, your majesty has not before been thus officially notified, and you may plead ignorance of the severity of our laws. But I now give my assurance that we mean to cut this harmful drug forever. That's a very respectful and diplomatic way of saying, please don't sell us opium. Don't do it. We don't want it. What's, um, what's more <clears throat> is that some Chinese did want to import it, right? Because there's always an illegal trade and stuff people will buy. So what the Chinese leaders did was go out and try to eradicate this importation of opium from uh, British India big time. So in 1839, there was about 20,000 chests. Chests means like a big bunch of opium destroyed. So there was a big push by Chinese authorities to end this um, opium importation by the British. And the British would have none of it. <clears throat> so what did they do? They sent in the ships, right? They sent in the British Navy in order to force the Chinese ports to accept the opium so they could sell it to ready buyers. Again, other Chinese folks were like, the Chinese drug dealers were like, man, we want this stuff because we can make a bunch of money selling it to other folks. So this is the Opium Wars. And how did, how did Britain win this small little island nation against this very huge historic um, nation? Well, the British had steam engine and better guns at this time, right? They were the beneficiaries of living in a place where people shared ideas <clears throat> and produced the Industrial Revolution. So through tools like this British steamer with an iron hull, if you have an iron hull, it's a lot harder to bomb and break, and they had better firepower. So after this like three or, I'm, I'm sorry, three year long series of battles ensued, um, Chinese officials said, you know what? We're gonna make you a deal. I know we don't have the technology you have at this moment, so at the Treaty of uh, Nanjing, the British asked for, you know what, if we can just have Hong Kong and have that be the center of our trade and export, we will be pleased, right? And Chinese officials said, fine. So here, um, the British controlled Hong Kong from 1841 to 1997, right, for a long time. And again, I forget if I've told you, I, I've told you, you can always look, uh, judge what the artist is trying to convey in the, in the photograph when you look at the dog. So here's another image of a chilled out dog showing that these dudes are all chill, right? And no war is gonna break out between them, right? The dog's chilled out, nobody's nipping at anybody's heels. <clears throat> so therefore, the British now, the red places are the British, uh, places of British colonization, right? You have South Africa, you have British Kenya over here, which we'll be talking about quite a bit later, British India, right? Australia, and now Hong Kong. You can see the underlying word over here, Hong Kong. <clears throat> and oh boy, did the British export opium to India. Look at this image. And Hannah, doesn't that blow you away? It's like a freaking Amazon warehouse of opium. Look at that. They did not have forklifts. They had dudes climbing these poles in order to bring down the balls of opium because they were stored like this so they would dry all along, right? They had to be, they had to dry out. Look at that. That's nine, almost a million pounds a year. And that's a million pounds in like their back in the day money, right? That is way more today. So British India's number one export of opium found a huge market in China. I would say no, they had a lot better ammunition, a lot more British and Chinese in that painting. Yeah, there are a lot more British and Chinese. It shows you who has conquered, right? Who's invited to the party. It's always interesting to see when treaties are signed, who's there, right? Who's invited to the party. So look at the Industrial Revolution created new products, new markets, and industrial scale production, right? It, look at that. This is an image 
And they're also showing you like this art historian and he's like, oh, look at the perspective, how cool. But also look at all these drying balls of opium everywhere. It's right incredible. And that's what there was a result of the opium wars in British India. And you might wonder why, geez, why do many folks in India speak English? Well, it's because of this. They were subject to the British crown for uh, centuries, a couple of centuries. So the main trade route, routes were right, boom, into the southern portion of China and then throughout. And this is part of the new imperialism that King Leopold wanted to replicate in the Congo. Right, this is a, an actually a British Empire propaganda poster. And it says, buy empire goods from home and overseas. So they're just trying to encourage the economic um, aspect of this globalized new imperialism. So Hannah, do you think they sold opium to people in Britain or they just wanted to sell it in China? What do you think, Hannah? Guesses are wrong. Anywhere they could. <clears throat> so opium was sold in Britain um, as laudanum. Laudanum is a mix of opium and alcohol, and it was sold by legit doctors as a cure for crying babies, right? Can you imagine your little kid sisters crying and be obnoxious so you like knock her up with some opioids. Or it was also sold for hysterical women. And this was a diagnosis that many doctors gave women just because they wanted women to just calm down. It's a, it's a very misogynistic um, prognosis for women. And this company here, right, important to mothers, patronized by her most gracious majesty, Queen, Queen Victoria. And I don't know for a fact that Queen Victoria actually gave her stamp of approval to Atkinson and Barker's for slinging opium to fellow British people. But here it is, right? Advertisement for ladies and babies. Go ahead and get high on your opium. And it was also sold in the United States. Um, for example, here is a Sears Roebuck catalog. And, um, Sears Roebuck was one of the first companies in the United States to send a catalog through the postal service to um, Americans and they could, Americans could buy stuff and the mail, uh, the mail person would deliver it to them. So here's an ad for laudanum. It says a sleep remedy, also aids in pain relief, yellow fever, cardiac disease, colds, dysentery, and an excessive secretion. Kind of yucky, but yeah, this is um, ads. I know, it's awful. I agree, Hannah. It's so awful and sad. But not everybody in the Western United States, I'm sorry, the United States and Western Europe was down for this. They knew that, oh my gosh, wait a minute, this stuff is addictive, it's bad for you, and it's causing a public health crisis. So here is a cartoon against opium and it's called the poor child's nurse. So this is a rather tragic image of this little baby um, all asleep here because apparently the mom has to go and work outside the house. So how does she go to work and leave her kid alone? She gets her all doped up on opium, right? So this cartoon is critiquing, right? The opium addiction and the state of um, the situation for impoverished Americans, which rather a powerful ad. <clears throat> the poor child's nurse. All right, I have to pivot to the United States real quick just to finish this. You know how a lot of the opium that's sold in the United States comes from Mexico? It's imported from South America and also, um, especially through the drug cartels in Mexico. And if you want, you want to get in depth into this rather tragic and dark subject, uh, join me in my Mexican American history class next semester. So pivot real quick to California. So California, gold has finally been found, right? Remember ever since Columbus, Europeans have been looking for gold in the Americas. And in, the 18, in 1848, it was discovered on the American River. Um, El Dorado is found. 
California experiences a population boom, right? Overnight, California goes from only 6,800 non-native peoples, right? Mostly Spanish-speaking people. In 1850, 92,000, right? And I say non-native because natives were not counted back then. So uh, California experiences an immigration boom from folks coming to the gold fields of California. And a large, uh, one of the main groups of people who came, came over across the Pacific Ocean from China, right? The Chinese population in California went from 25 grand to 35 grand, right? This is a huge bump up from nearly nothing in 1840, okay? <clears throat> However, since you know about the opium wars now, what do you think, what else did Chinese folks bring over with them um, when they went to work in the fields? I'm picking on you, Hannah. What else did they bring over with them that was commonplace in China? Opium, yep. So this is the introduction, one of the major introductions of opium to the United States. Right, here's an opium den in California, right? And these folks are all drugged up, doing nothing, just kind of uh, all worthless and high. However, a series of events happened in the United States, and there was a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment growing in the later part of the 1850s in the United States. So there was this 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act which excluded Chinese immigrants and, made, and kicked out many Chinese immigrants, uh, Chinese Americans from the United States. So where did many of the Chinese folks go? To Mexico, to Northern Mexico. And this is the beginning of Mexico's relationship, or I don't know, I'm not saying it correctly, with Mexico being the number one, one of the main sources of opium production in the mountains of Sinaloa, right uh, south of the border. And some of the first drug cartel bosses in Mexico were Chinese Mexicans, right? Like these guys here. It wasn't until the 1930s that um, ethnic Mexicans took over the whole opium production. Um, but that's why we have, that's one of the reasons we, why we have this drug trade in which Mexico exports drugs to the United States and we export guns and money to Mexico, right? This very Mexican-American trade started with um, Chinese Americans coming over and started with British Empire selling opium to China. Okay, I am done, I believe. Sorry. Okay, if you have any questions, everybody, Zoom me or contact me. Please, please, please. 